Hello. Okay, so this is on WireGuard, which is a next generation VPN tunnel specifically made for the Linux kernel. Uh, so a bit of background first. Uh, Jason Donenfeld, the internet knows me by the strange handles, the XTC4. I'm, uh, I'm mainly from the security world. Uh, do exploitation, kernel vulns, crypto vulns, uh, root kits, uh, defensive security, offensive security. Um, I, I've been into kernel development for many years, and I wanted to make a VPN that avoided a lot of the issues that I've seen I in the field, uh, on the job, finding VPN deployments and these systems that break horribly, and I wanted to kind of fix the things I've seen out there. Uh, so what is WireGuard? It's a layer three uh, secure network tunnel for V4 and v for V6. and. Uh, uh We'll do a small overview of what WireGuard is. Uh, other talks I've given have kind of gone into the details of the protocol and all these things, uh, but I kind of want to get into the more uh, kernel-y things. Um, but what one thing is that a lot of decisions made in WireGuard are very opinionated. So it's a VPN protocol, but it's layer three only, not layer two, because I think layer three is the right way to make your secure tunnels. And uh, kind of throughout, there are a lot of these decisions already made. To to create a simpler, uh, a simpler situation that I think leads to better overall security. Um, as I said, it's been designed for the Linux kernel, um, but of course there are kind of the cross-platform, ton-tap-based user space things too for interoperability, but it's really dedicated for the kernel. Uh, it's UDP-based, so works on the internet. Um, it uses new crypto, but uh, modern crypto, but it, it's uh, conservative. We're not doing anything too funky uh, or, or controversial. Um, and the emphasis of the whole project is on being really uh, simple and auditable, uh, trying to keep a small code base, uh, understandable concepts, uh, the kind of thing you can wrap your head around in an afternoon instead of uh, you know, uh, years trying to understand XFRM or IPsec or, or what have you. Um, the authentication model is similar to SSH's uh, authenticated keys where two sides share their public keys and then they can talk. Uh, there are no certificates or X509 or ASN1 or anything like that. Um, so it is, it's kind of a, a very simplified model and the key distribution aspects then are, are handled by the various other out-of-band things that already do key distribution like uh, SSH even or LDAP or you know a, 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 anything you already have in place. Um, the code base itself actually grew out of a stealth rootkit project. Uh, I needed a way to exfiltrate data uh, in a stealthy way from kernel space. And it turns out that a lot of the things that you need when you're trying to be stealthy and, and trying to harden up a, a rootkit are actually really useful defensive measures for a real, uh, a real piece of infrastructure. Um, but WireGuard is, is kind of blasphemous. We break a lot of the, the kind of academically correct layering assumptions, uh, things like IPsec with the transformation table, um, and user space daemon doing the keying. Uh, in WireGuard, we kind of smush everything together where you just have a WireGuard interface, which makes things a lot more simple. But because we've gotten rid of these kind of pristine layering uh, things we we were forced then to kind of resolve issues that come up when we break the layering but I think for each issue that's come up we've solved it in a way that makes the the, the overall result of the project a lot cleaner and simpler um, so we start with uh, a struct net device it's kind of the the basic building block of this as I mentioned it's really easily audit auditable um, open VPN is like hundred thousand lines of code XFRM is 13,000 lines, but then you need strong swan for the key exchange, which is massive. Soft ether is big too. In WireGuard, it's less than 4,000 lines of code. So uh, something you could sit down and read the entirety of in an afternoon and uh, really understand it in depth. So in the, the solar system of, of VPNs, we're, we're Pluto all the way out there. Uh, so it works just with a normal network interface. You IP link add, to add what set your addresses, your routes, all the things you know about network interfaces kind of work as you'd expect. Um, 
Uh, importantly, it appears stateless to the administrator. This is a really important con concept. You add an interface, you configure the peers it's going to talk to and any keys and allowed IPs, as I'll, I'll show, and then you can just start sending packets. It doesn't have any concept of uh, connection state. Is it, is it connected? Which peers are it connected to? Uh, has a handshake happen? It doesn't really expose these concepts. It's just it's configured or it's not configured. And when it's configured, it can send packets. Um, it also has roaming, like Mosh, if you've ever used it. So you can uh, move between IPs or between uh, Wi-Fi and, and 4G or uh, put your laptop to sleep in one place, open it up in another, and things kind of keep working because it's either on or it's off. It doesn't have a, a connection state. Uh, and so the, the fundamental thing that allows us to smush things down to interface is what, what I call crypto key routing, uh, which is an association of, uh, of a peer, which is identified by its public key, and a list of IP addresses that that peer is allowed to be inside the tunnel. So th the basic system is like this. A WireGuard interface has its private key, it has a UDP port it listens on, and it has a list of peers. Uh, each peer has its own public key, which is how it's identified, and then it has a list of these allowed IPs, th a list of these IPs that it's allowed to be within the tunnel. And it optionally has an endpoint IP and port. Um, optional because if you don't specify it, then it learns it on its own from roaming, uh, just like in Mosh. Uh, so a fundamental concept here is that public key then has a mapping directly to an IP address. Um, you can't have two peers that share the exact same slash 32 for, for an allowed IP. Um, you have, uh, so you have this really strict mapping between a public key uh, that is a peer and an IP address. Uh, so just to kind of show you configuration example, a server has a listening port, a private key, and uh, two peers. And this peer is allowed to be this slash 32 and this slash 24. And this one gets this 32 and this 16. Then a client would have the private his own private key, the public key here that corresponds to the private key of the server, and it might give everything for allowed IPs, which would mean I'll let the server tunnel me the internet. You know, if you're trying to get your internet through a, a VPN provider, for example. It could also do something more restrictive if it only wants a certain subnet from uh, this peer it's talking to. Uh, so uh, this setup makes system administration really, really simple. If it comes from WG0, and it's from Yoshi's tunnel IP of 192.168.5.17, then it definitely came from Yoshi. You don't need any other, uh, you know, of, uh, IP table security marks or anything like that. It's just, it's from the WireGuard interface, and it's from the IP that you had given to this peer, then it definitely came to that peer, and WireGuard ensures that cryptographically. Uh, and, I mean, you could already kind of imagine what the IP table rules would be in a, in a WireGuard setup. This is uh, so uh, before we get into the kernel things, I just want to show a demo of what it's like to set it up so you kind of see it in action, and then we'll, we'll start getting into implementation details. Okay, so we have peer A and, and peer B, and we generate a private key. We generate a private key using wggenkey, and we just write it into this file private. And if we cat the file, we see it's just this really short base64 thing. We can derive a public key from a private key trivially just by sending the private into wgpubkey, and then we get the corresponding public key. OK, so we add a wg0 interface. We give it an IP address, kind of all the standard things you'd expect. And then we can say wg set wg0 to give it the private key that we just generated. And then we can set it up. And we'll do the same on peer B. So we make an interface, we add an IP address for it. And then we call set wg0 private key, we give the private key we just created, and we set it up. So now we have this wg0 on each end. Um, 
So if we hit IP address, we can see uh, we have here our WG0 that we just added. And there's our, our Ethernet device with this IP, kind of the external IP address. And then here's WG0 with our, our internal IP address. And so now we'll tell the two peers about each other so that they can talk. So if we hit WG now, we see public key and a private key. Uh, and there's a listening port. And we can now say, OK, peer A is going to learn peer B's public key. And peer B is allowed to be 10002 in the tunnel. Um, and that's its internet facing endpoint, 192.168.125.8.20. And now we can tell peer B about peer A doing the exact same copy and paste, where the public key for that peer is this. We paste it in. We give it the allowed IPs. It's, it can be in the tunnel, so 10.0.0.1. And we give it the internet-facing IP address. We only have to give the internet-facing IP address on one of these, actually, because it'll learn automatically through the roaming. Uh, but after we do that, we can just ping, and it works. It, it does all the crypto behind the scenes. So there's kind of no, is it connected? You just set it up and it goes. And we hit WGZ there, then you can see some information about what actually happened. But from the admin point of view, it just, it's just on. You configure it and it goes. Uh, so that's, that's about it as opposed to using it. There, it's not really more complicated than that. OK, so there's, as we saw, there's WG, which is just this very simple tool uh, for configuring things. Maybe it'll be folded into IP Route 2 at some point, or maybe it's best to keep that kind of thing standalone discussion to be had uh, down the line. Um, but very simple, and you can kind of build other tools on top of this. It's basic building block is this kind of bare bones WG tool, and then you can make all sorts of network management things if you wanted to. Uh, there's a Netlink-based API um, that just has two commands, to get to get all the device info and set to set the device. Um, it, it takes a, a big Netlink message with uh, the device information and then a nested list of all the peers, and then each peer has a nested list of the allowed IPs. Um, and uh, we fragment this up into pieces uh, uh, and put it into a bunch of different SKBs and... Um, Seems to work okay. For, for getting, it's, uh, we only do dump. You, you can't get an individual peer. It's just you get everything all at once. And uh, it seems to be fast enough. Um, on the roadmap, might be adding some multicast event notifications through Netlink. So um, maybe when a handshake is initialized, some specific applications want a notification of that. And we could add that, that kind of thing pretty easily. Um, so this is actually really easily composed and integrated, and it's already been put into a lot of things. There's a, a Debian IF up-down helper for it. It's in the core repository now of, of OpenWRT and lead. Uh, it's kind of a, a essential part of their system. Uh, it's part of OpenRC. It's part of NixOS. BuildRoot supports it. Uh, Linux kit from the Docker people and now have this as kind of their central networking component. Uh, it's available for EdgeOS, uh, like the, the Ubiquity, Viata stuff. Um, the phone in my pocket runs it, and, uh, integrates with Android's native network management things. Uh, there's work in progress integration going on for System D, Network D, and for Network Manager. And just with WG alone, uh, everyone has you know their trivial shell script to <coughs> set things up. Um, and there are also packages already for about 20 different distributions of all all sorts, so you can you can apt get it and, and all the rest. Um, with the tools package, we do ship one really simple shell script called WG Quick, which is like the normal WG format, except it takes additionally an address in a DNS, and then it calls IP route add and, uh, and IP address add and <coughs> resolve conf and all the rest. But this is just a silly little bash script that automates things people do commonly with it. But uh, it seems like a lot of people, when they need more complicated things, they take this, they modify it, and they have uh, you know, a million different possibilities. OK, so how is this, this stateless configuration thing done? Now, obviously, it's a stateful protocol. I mean, you can't do good crypto without having some kind of state that's kept. Um, but it appears stateless to the administrator. 
And uh, we do this with uh, a very simple series of timers uh, and a little state machine uh, that's eventless, uh, that's, that's event based. And uh, the state machine has been drawn up in such a way that uh, you, can, you can write the whole thing down and see that there are no undefined state transitions possible. So it's a, a fully complete state machine. Um, so user space sends a packet. If there's been no session established for 120 seconds, then we send a handshake initiation packet. If there's no response after five seconds, we resend a handshake initiation. Right, that is, we send a new one. We don't retransmit, we just send a new one. Um, if there is successful authentication of an incoming packet, then we send an empty authenticated packet after 10 seconds if we don't have anything else to send. So if you're talking to me and I don't have anything natural to send back to you, then I'll just send you nothing but authenticated so that at least you know I, I heard your message. Um, but if you're not talking to me and I'm not talking to you, then we don't have to send each other anything, so it's not chatty. So then if we don't get anything after 15 seconds, then we know, uh-oh, I've been sending something to someone and they haven't sent anything back to me, so there's probably some disconnections, so we'd send a handshake initiation, so we, we start over. And uh, this super simple model wi winds up giving us really nice properties where things are just always on when you need it, but then it's not on, it, it doesn't send any packets when you stop using it. Um, so it's not a chatty protocol, but it's always available nonetheless. WireGuard makes use of a lot of nice tricks to do things for uh, network namespaces. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, it's UDP based. So that means we, uh, we have a, a socket that's part of the driver. Um, and you can have your WireGuard interface in one namespace and you say your physical interfaces or other interfaces in another namespace and the socket that it uses will always live in the namespace where the device was first added. So if you add WireGuard and say you're in a namespace and then you move the interface to a different namespace, the socket remains in init namespace. Um, so you can do really cool things like this, like you can you can make a, a container only allowed to access the internet through WireGuard or, uh, well, we'll look at some diagrams. So th for the container interface, you could have um, WG0 in your container namespace in your Docker container or whatever. It pings in clear text. And then the, the driver encrypts things and sends the UDP ciphertext out through the init namespace because the socket is actually living where the device was originally created. Um, so this would give kind of a, a perfect isolation to a container where its only way of accessing the outside world is through this encrypted and authenticated tunnel. Uh, or we can reverse the picture where we could give your init namespace only the WG0 interface um, and then put your, make say a uh, namespace called physical where we would put you know, your ethernet or wireless. And that way when, you, when you're loading your web browser in the init namespace, the only thing your web browser can see is WG0 because, uh, uh, because the other interfaces are in the physical namespace. Um, and so again, then you get no, uh, no possible leakage. Um, and this is made possible because we always keep the socket in the original namespace where the device was created. Um, we do some nice policy routing things. You can set the FW mark on these outgoing UDP packets. Um, so this would be the same uh, in user space where you make a socket and you call SO mark on it. Um, and this works pretty well. It allows us to you know, do IP rules with FW mark and suppress prefix and whatnot. Um, but uh, there's a, a patch it posted uh, maybe a year and a half or two ago that I need to follow up on and, and kind of push to its end uh, this uh, not OIF or SO not OIF where you could specify to your struct flow I that you want it to find a way of routing the packet that assumes a certain interface doesn't exist. So you could avoid routing loops when you're, when you're trying to send things out. So you could override the default route, um, uh, but then the packets that are encrypted wouldn't go out through WireGuard, it'd go out through everything else except WireGuard. Um, 
This has an analog in user space, would be uh, SO, not OIF, where you could mark a socket as having this property. I want the socket to route things such that a particular interface doesn't exist. Um, so that, that's something I need to follow up on. It'll be interesting to, to, to see the, the feedback of you all about that. Uh, as I mentioned, it's a stealthy protocol. Um, so it doesn't respond to any unauthenticated packets. Um, so you can't scan for WireGuard services on the internet. It only will respond if you're sending a packet that has the right crypto that authenticates correctly. And uh, as I mentioned, it's not chatty. When there's no data to be sent, it just stops sending data. It goes to sleep. It, it doesn't keep going. So this is really nice for mobile, where uh, uh, it's not using any battery just to keep the connection alive, because there's not really a connection. Uh, there's a lot of defense in depth uh, security practices that uh, went into z designing it. Um, all the state that's required for WireGuard to work is allocated during configuration time, uh, not in relation to packets being sent. Um, and so since there's no dynamic memory allocation, you can kind of throw away a whole variety of bugs uh, that, that come out of that. Um, the packet parsing itself uh, uh, doesn't exist because everything is fixed width. Um, so we don't have to, you know, do any crazy ASM one parsing or whatever else. And so it's the kind of thing where we, if we have, if we have no parser, then we have no parser bugs. Uh, kind of a magical way of eliminating uh, vulnerabilities. And the last thing is important. We don't modify any state in response to unauthenticated packets. Um, and this is especially important to have because we're not allocating any memory in response to received packets, which means if we are going to modify the memory we have allocated, it better be in response to something that's authentic, not just some, some random stuff. Um, so uh, th these requirements make it nice for kind of a lightweight kernel environment, but also really heavily imp impacted the crypto that went into designing it uh, to actually make a protocol that uh, could be implemented like this. Um, a lot of times, crypto protocols, first comes the cryptography, and then it's kind of left up to the programmers to figure out the best way to implement it. But um, this has been done a little bit in reverse or kind of in tandem with each other, where uh, I had this concern, how do I want to implement it? What, what environment is it for? All right, now I'll look at what cryptographic methods are available. Um, and so this, this forces us to be one round trip for the handshake. Um, we also have really fast crypto primitives. Um, we use uh, Cha Cha 20, Poly 1 through 5 for symmetric encryption, which is fast on, on all hardware, not just, uh, not just uh, Intel, like say AES and I. So uh, we'll go into details on that later. Um, uh, there's also a really clear division between uh, the slow path for the handshake, um, for things like elliptic curve cryptography, and the fast path for symmetric crypto for the actual packet encryption. Um, and I suppose this is akin to, in IPsec, you have the key and uh, daemon being separate in user space. Um, but uh, in this, we're doing it all in kernel space. Um, and because we smush it together, we can take advantage of uh, uh, kind of signaling events that happen uh, in both the data plane and the handshake plane. Uh, but there still is a clear separation between them. Uh, and while all the talk about crypto design just for the kernel might be scary. Uh, this has actually been formally verified uh, using a tool called Tamarin where we uh, wrote up the whole model of all the crypto that's happening and um, we've now developed mathematical proofs that it's not nonsense. Uh, actually works. It fits the security properties we claim it does, etc. cetera. Um, th so this is curious. We, we want to do multi-core cryptography. Um, uh, so, for a lot of processor-intensive things in the kernel, um, in the in the networking stack anyway, the idea is well, if you have a bunch of different flows, you put each flow per core, and because most routers are dealing with tons of different flows, this will kind of work out over time, and uh, there's no need to make a single flow fast. Um, but actually, I think in a lot of cases, you do want a single flow to be fast, especially if you're running this on some, some tiny home router and you're trying to download a file, you know, a, a single file or a, a movie stream. You don't want that to be pegged to a single core. You want a single flow to be able to take a, 
uh, advantage of multiple cores. Um, uh, so th this is a bit of a different requirement than, than previous things have, have tried to account for. Um, uh, th there's a, there's a, a parallel aspect and a serial aspect. The parallel aspect is that um, packets can be encrypted and decrypted in parallel on lots of cores, but uh, the transmission of packets has to be done in, in serial uh, because uh, you don't want out of order packets. And likewise, uh, nonce checking or sequence number checking has to be done in order. Um, so uh, the parallel encryption queue is multi-producer, multi-consumer. Um, right now we're using uh, the, the pointer queue dot H, uh, which is a, it's a great ring buffer structure, but it's not lockless. So uh, I'm looking now at trying to make this a, a lockless structure, but Remains to be seen how much this will help things. Uh, uh, lockless things are great for uh, having tons of cores and reducing contention, but sometimes you wind up spinning anyway on a compare and exchange. So uh, some kind of future research to, to look into for that. Um, uh, also, we're, we started to use a lockless linked list, um, but that winds up being really hard and terrible to implement. So we're, we're back to the ring buffer. Um, the traditional wisdom for this kind of thing says, well, really you should just do a single queue per CPU, um, and then you don't have this, this problem of multi-producer, multi-consumer. Um, and while indeed this reduces lock contention, um, uh, it makes the scheduler now an important part of the packet flow. So if, say, you're distributing a bunch of packets to these different CPU cores, and they need to then be transmitted later on in a particular order. Um, if you have a queue per, c per CPU, it means the scheduler has to hit each of these CPUs before it can transmit a packet. So if you have packet one on CPU eight and uh, the rest of the packets on CPUs one through seven, uh, now you have to wait for the, the scheduler to get all the way to CPU eight in order to start transmitting things because it needs to transmit the first packet first. Uh, so by making things a single queue but shared by all CPUs, then it means whichever CPU the scheduler happens to give uh, uh, can start encrypting packets. Um, now interestingly for receiving packets, uh, though the trend in most drivers is to use NetIFRX, um, and queue things up, we actually don't want an additional queue. Um, we use NetIF receive SKB instead so that we block while it's being received so that um, we actually wind up filling up the, the serial queue for longer so that if, um, if packets come in and the serial queue is already massive because, say, uh, NetIF receive SKB is really slow, then we push back on adding new packets to it. And that way we don't wind up discarding packets because the net IFRX queue is full. We discard them early on before we waste the cycles for uh, decryption. Um, it turns out that if we bunch of uh, packets together uh, so that uh, related packets are encrypted all in order on the same CPU um, instead of spreading them out, we get a bunch of performance gains. Um, of course, we want things to be uh, in parallel in general, but say a series of packets that just came in uh, winds up being a lot faster to, to implement a big chunk or a bundle of packets immediately on the same, on the same core. Uh, so the question that comes out of this then is, how big do we make the bundles? If, is it best to do uh, 40 packets at a time or 100 packets? Or what's the deal? How do we choose the size? Uh, so it turns out that GSO gives us the answer. We advertise that WireGuard accepts a GSO super packet, and then in the driver itself we call uh, SKB GSO segment, so that then we have all the individual packets. But now we know that these packets are related, that these are bunched up, and so we can queue these up as a discrete uh, item um, in, in, I guess, a linked list each. So uh, picturing this, we have our ring buffer of each of the items, and each item in the ring buffer points to this linked list of, uh, of GSO segments. Um, 
So of course, in all this, we have queuing. Uh, big question then is how to determine queue lengths. Um, one approach is just to have a fixed queue length, which is simple. Um, if we don't make it too big, then we won't get buffer bloat. But how does this scale on different speed CPUs? A, a lot of questions to be answered there. Um, so looking at now trying to use uh, DQL for determining queue length, or perhaps even better, uh, using FQCODL. Um, if we go with the FQCODL route, then there's a big question of whether or not we should use it by the queue disk layer. Um, and then we'd be starting and stopping sub queues as things get full, uh, or using it directly. Um, there's also this issue of fairness between queues versus fairness per flow. Um, if we go with FQCODL on the queue disk layer, uh, one disadvantage of that is then we can no longer be an IFF no queue interface. Um, turns out with a, with a no queue interface, you can return from NDO star XMIT an error number that gets passed up to user space directly, which is really nice because we can give more descriptive errors to user space of why a packet might not be, be sent. Um, but there's also ICMP for this kind of thing, which we're also using in the case that uh, uh, WireGuard's running on a router. Um, uh, there, there's kind of an open question with sending ICMP packets from a struct net device. Um, what if the packet's already been transformed by SNAT? Uh, in which case, calling ICMP on this, we use the SNATed address for the rate limiting, um, which is problematic. So it's unclear right now if, if net filter needs uh, and connection tracking needs to link in to ICMP send, um, or if this can be still hidden in net filter. Oops. Um, so uh, open issue we've been discussing here a bit. Um, some people want to send in-band messages, so uh, uh, configuration in info within the tunnel. Uh, that would not be IP packets. Uh, people want this for dynamic IP addresses, uh, you know, a DHCP replacement kind of thing. Uh, some folks want to do a post-quantum exchange within the WireGuard tunnel. Other really monstrous things, people have all sorts of stuff they want to put over a, a control band. And, um, so I, I wonder, is, is this useful? Do we want this? Um, what situations really necessitate it? And um, which other use cases can be punted to a, an out-of-band mechanism or just statically configured? Uh, in other words, for how long can I say no to the people asking for this and have things work? Um, and I hope I can keep saying no, but maybe there are good use cases. Um, and so I, I've started to think about the uh, best way to implement that. So. Uh, three approaches. First would be to add AF WireGuard, where uh, send to and receive from take a, a SOC address WG. That's actually the peer's public key. Um, and I mean, this is super sleek and elegant. Wow, you make a socket and address things right to the public key and works with all the socket APIs. Uh, but of course, now we're adding a, you know, a new AF and the, the bar is quite high to justify that. Um, on one hand, it's good because this would open up interesting uses that I, you know, we can't really foresee. But on the other hand, do we want people using WireGuard for this? Maybe not. So uh, a more conservative approach would just be a, a Netlink event. You have a multicast event when receiving a message, and you do a, a Netlink call when you want to send one. Uh, and this would kind of reinforce the fact that it's for control configuration messages and not full-blown protocol. But AF WireGuard sounds kind of cool, so maybe something to discuss. Uh, and as I mentioned, the uh, most attractive option is just not doing it at all, uh, keeping things out of band to be simpler, clearer. Um, but maybe in band is necessary. Maybe. Maybe not. Uh, am I doing time? Yikes. Um, WireGuard has uh, sticky sockets. Um, so it always listens on all IP addresses. It doesn't, you can't specify that you want to bind to a particular IP address because I don't want to have ACLs based on uh, where you're binding to because there's already authentication within the WireGuard protocol. If a packet makes it to, to the UDP port and it correctly authenticates using the crypto, then I know it's good. I don't care where it came from. Um, so there, uh, there's really no need to allow binding to to other addresses, but this does beg the question, well, what about the source address when I'm sending packets? Um, so with some clever use of, uh, of the desk lookup APIs, um, it's possible to keep track 
of the destination address when receiving a packet uh, to then use that as the source address when sending a packet. Um, but making sure that this kind of stickiness isn't too sticky so that it, it defaults back uh, to the, the default source address when things change. Um, and uh, the nice thing about this is the semantics for sticky sockets map clearly to something that can be done in user space too with uh, IP packet info. So um, it's not necessarily behavior that requires weird kernel things because you can, you can get it out of IP packet info. Uh, WireGuard makes extensive use of mem0 explicit uh, to zero out uh, ephemeral information from memory so that uh, there really is forward secrecy that you can't dump someone's physical memory and say, oh, look, and all these uh, deallocated uh, uh, parts of the heap, there are these old keys. No, we, we zero it out. Um, uh, disturbingly, a lot of crypto related in the code in the kernel forgets to do this or it doesn't care, uh, KTLS, but just kind of a bunch of different parts of the stack. So it uh, might be worthwhile at some point to clean that up. Uh, but one thing I, I am finding problematic is uh, Netlink uses uh, SKBs, obviously. Um, uh, but if I'm putting secret data through uh, SKB, how do I make sure it's zeroed? Um, I can do this when the kernel receives an SKB because I can just zero out that part of memory before calling k-free SKB. But when I'm sending the SKB back up to user space, I don't have that same type of control over what happens to the SKB at the end. So uh, I'd like to propose a, a new flag for the SKB, something SKB zero on free, perhaps. Uh, I, I could assign the destructor, except um, I'm, I'm sending things to user space socket, and that's already assigned a, a destructor. So I guess I could wrap the pointer to that and put it in the CB and, yeah, terrible, right? Yeah, so th there's got to be, s I think we might need a new thing for this, but discussion to be had. Uh, the, the biggest issue right now with WireGuard blocking it from, from patch series is uh, the crypto API really, uh, th there's a lot of work to be done on this. Uh, WireGuard uses its own internal crypto API uh, because the existing one isn't sufficient. Um, I'd like to start reworking the crypto API in 2018 uh, <laughs> with pleasure. Uh, I, I want to add things more direct function calls instead of through this huge abstraction layer. Um, WireGuard changes keys frequently and I don't want to have to allocate a new structure every time I want to use a new key. Um, I, I don't want to have to deal with, uh, with physical memory addresses when I just want to uh, encrypt something I've made on the stack, for example. I mean, there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of like very basic API things that can be replaced. And um, even for the primitives themselves, a, a lot of them are in a pretty shabby shape. And so I've been working, people at Inria, we've been talking about uh, maybe adding formally verified primitives to the kernel. Um, uh, another big issue is um, if you want to use the, the fast instructions on these processors, um, you have to, uh, you have to get, you have to ask permission to use the FPU. So, you, um, so this usually results in a massive save of uh, if user space is using these registers, um, and then a restore when you're done with it. And in the current crypto API, this is done for every call uh, of the crypto API. But um, uh, if you're encrypting a bunch of packets one after another on the same thread, you don't want to have to be toggling back and forth between saving and restoring these FPU. It's, it's super expensive. Uh, so wi with my own thing, I'm able to kind of batch this, hoist it outside of the loop, so it's only done saved and restored once per thread. Um, though uh, th this is straightforward and obvious what's happening, maybe a, a, a different approach would be just to make the restore lazy, only actually restore when changing context. Um, is, is that, that's one possibility as well. Um, it's super fast uh, because it's in the kernel and not on tap device, fast, low latency, like you'd expect. There's not a million copies. Um, I did this before. Cha Cha 20 Poly 1 through 5 is really nice because um, uh, it performs well on pretty much all architectures, on MIPS, on, on old ARM. Um, and uh, on AVX 512, it's even faster than AES NI. Um, Looks like I'm running out of time, so I'll try and hurry up. Um, 
And, and so, well, uh, well, it'd be nice to, you know, uh, get on the AES bandwagon. Uh, AES is super hard to implement that in a way that's fast and invulnerable to, to cache timing attacks on, uh, on normal hardware. So uh, ChaCha20 uh, is uh, re really quite nice for this. Um, and also, WireGuard, I think, is, is fast because it's small. I mean, uh, less code, faster program. Uh, this is a stupid general statement, but for a lot of cases, it happens to be so. Um, there's, it's just doing less. It's, it's, it's simple. Uh, and so the performance graphs are, are favorable. Uh, I had hinted at this earlier today uh, in asking a question. There's an extensive continuous integration suite um, that tries out all sorts of topologies and weird behaviors and interaction with NetFilter and different peers coming and going. Um, and every commit is tested on all the kernels listed on kernel.org. Um, uh, freshly built and run in QMU, and this whole thing goes and uh, does it on a bunch of different architectures. Um, it has built-in self-tests as well, and buildwireguard.com has all the, the current status. A and this kind of infrastructure has been really immensely useful. Um, I can push commits up kind of fast and frivolously, and then I can watch them break, go back and, and fix things up. Um, every time I find a bug, I can add a little thing to the, to the test suite. Um, I think a part of upstreaming WireGuard will be upstreaming some, some components of this infrastructure as well, because I think it could be really useful for the general ecosystem. Uh, so upstream roadmap, uh, before we're done. Um, so I mentioned maybe multicast Netlink events for these notifications, maybe in-band messages, maybe not, I don't know. Um, the crypto API is kind of top of the list of things to start tackling. And then once crypto API in the kernel has been changed, then I'll port WireGuard from my kind of stopgap solution over to the improved crypto API. Um, hoping sometime next year for the initial patch series. Um, as I mentioned, it's already in many distributions. It sees regular testing, um, OpenWRT and Linux Kit, et cetera. Um, there are already commercial VPN providers that are selling services with it. Uh, so it's seeing huge production use. Um, seeing use in uh, kind of like top 100 web pages and in massive financial institutions. Uh, so it's getting a lot of testing and cycles. Um, and we're doing kind of every week or every other week uh, a snapshot. Uh, so now's, now's the time to start getting upstream feedback on the way it's designed, you know, what needs to change before upstreaming. Um, okay, so to conclude, it's available for all distros. WireGuard.com slash install will give you the list. Uh, you can build into your kernel, compile it as a module, uh, there's a peer-reviewed paper published this year at NDSS. They can read if you want kind of the crypto background and the overall design. Uh, there's a mailing list, Git repo, WireGuard on Freenode. I have stickers for everyone here. If you didn't already get them, I have copious quantities of stickers I'm eager to give out. Um, of course, if anyone wants to, to work on stuff, uh, there's plenty of work to be done. Uh, that's all. Thanks. Just one question. I have only one quick thing to say. I would like you to upstream this earlier rather than later. So if you have to make a decision about when you're going to do it, I would like you to err on the side of doing it as quickly as possible. I mean, even as an RFC patch set that's in an early state of being for review and feedback, I really want to start seeing it on that dev sometime soon. OK, that's good. So I'll, I can just put RFCs not to be merged now, but just to solicit feedback. All right. Oh, Jason.